everyone. This is the uh, second episode in our series of um, evaluate of conversations that uh, we where we aim to evaluate uh, the uh, implementation of anti-trafficking legislation 20 years after the adoption of the uh, Palermo Protocol of the United Nations. My name is Borisov Gerasimov. I uh, I work with the Global Alliance Against Trafficking Women. And I'm joined here by Sharmila Parmanant, uh, a PhD student in Gender Studies at the University of Cambridge, and Archana Kotecha from Liberty Shared. Thank you, Archana, so much for making the time to speak with us today. Can you start by introducing uh, yourself and the work of Liberty Shared? Sure, thanks for having me, Bobby, and, and good to be on with, with Sharmila as well. Um, my name is Archana Kotecha, and I'm actually a human rights lawyer with um, Liberty Shared. I'm the Asia Region Director and also the Head of Legal. And Liberty Shared is a Hong Kong and US registered anti-trafficking NGO. We focus primarily on um, uh, sort of legal technology and advocacy sort of interventions. Our focus is very much on systemic issues rather than actually direct victim support. So we work a lot with various stakeholders such as banks and financial institutions, at a certain number of corporates, NGOs that are working on the ground doing cases. And in some cases, we do have direct interaction uh, with, with victims. I want to ask you to um, reflect broadly on the um, uh, Palermo Protocol and its implementation over the past 20 years. Um, and you can do so in relation to Asia, if you wish, or globally. I know you work in many regions of the world. Um, so what are some of the positive and negative aspects of the implementation of the Palermo Protocol uh, in your view and based on your experience? Sure. I mean, I'll focus most of my comments on Southeast Asia because my work is very much focused in this region. We do cases across four jurisdictions um, and are very much, you know, regional in that perspective. And um, we also work with um, laws and regulations from different jurisdictions like the UK and US as well. So. Uh, relatively familiar with those as well. I think, you know, from a positive perspective, um, I guess the Palermo Protocol gave the offense a parameter, a face, a name, and a direction. It created a framework that allowed people to coalesce around the framework. It there was a criminal offense. Uh, there were other offenses that were tagged along, and this became a very widely ratified uh, tool amongst various nations. I think um, it, it created, it then led to the creation of several policies, uh, legislation, convictions, prosecutions, etc. So it really sort of was at the origin of a whole movement that, you know, brought various stakeholders in different spaces together. Um, now, when the Palermo Protocol was established, it was very much from a border security sort of lens and, and prevention. It was drafted by um, law enforcement individuals and it was not born out of the UN human rights treaty system, but rather out of the uh, crime, transnational crime conventions. So, you know, when you look at the instrument itself, um, it has pulled away over the years from the core human rights treaty system. And that is problematic because, you know, we are talking essentially about a tool that really is about vulnerable people's rights. But yet, when you assess the Palermo Protocol uh, in comparison to the European Convention, for example, and the European Directive, one sees very much that the slant is very much law enforcement, whereas the others have, have achieved a much better balance between victim protection and law enforcement as well. Um, I feel the Palermo Protocol does not go enough into the rights of victims and, and the sort of, you know, victims are very much couched as enforcement tools. And what I've seen happen in practice is that you need a victim to enforce the law or to have a successful prosecution. And that's their ultimate value to the system. And they're not treated as people whose rights have been violated and who need to be made whole. And that, you know, that for me as a lawyer is a very difficult situation to work with because I often get asked by, by, by clients, you know, why should I go through with this? Because ultimately the prosecutor or the justice system's idea of justice does not always tally with the victim's idea of justice. 
So it becomes very difficult. And, you know, I see all the time victims who are criminalized. The law that is designed to protect them is actually used to criminalize them for immigration offenses, criminal offenses, prostitution related offenses. And, you know, it then becomes an issue of I should just be quiet because if I say anything, if I participate in my own case, I end up criminalizing myself further and further. So the non-criminalization provision in the Palermo Protocol, um, sorry, that is alluded to, but not really specified in the Palermo Protocol, but specified in later uh, guidance, um, is something that is escaping the sort of bounds of, of that protocol as well. I mean, if you look at it, it focuses a lot on individual coercion. So the idea that there is a bad guy and, you know, the bad guy needs to be prosecuted or there might be five or six bad guys. But these are individuals who are coercing, you know, a victim or several victims. What it doesn't capture is systemic coercion. How do we get to systemic coercion? Because the truth is that for individual coercion to happen, there is a whole system that allows it to happen. There is a whole system that allows recruitment fees. There is a whole system that actually allows um, uh, women to be paid by piece rate for uh, the work that they do the whole day so that they can never even make minimum wage. And there is a system that allows multiple layers of subcontracting so that companies can benefit and workers lose out. So if we are not going to deal with that in our criminal justice system, and this is clearly not dealt with in the Palermo Protocol, it's not contemplated within it, then how do we get to the bottom of those situations? So there are, there are some significant gaps that are left you know, wide open. And I think the other, the other perspective is that when you, when you think about you know, the little, so little focus on, on, um, on victims, on the re-traumatization that the criminal justice system puts people through, on the fact that you know, detention for the benefit of proceedings is a very common practice across the world. Um, and all of these are very much promoted in the fact that you know, this is all about law enforcement and victims are valued within that context as well. Um, people's lives in limbo, I mean, it doesn't even take into account, you know, the elements of, of how difficult it is to actually um, enforce such a big definition. Because in practice, when you have to prove these three elements that may cut across several countries, several parties, and all of it relies on one poor vulnerable person's testimony, um, you often don't get a good case off the ground. And in many countries in the region, we are finding that identification of victims is contingent on how good their case is or how winnable their case is. This should never be the case. There should be a complete separation be between the identification of, of individuals and whether their case is likely to be successful or not. And in between that, there must be a reflection and recovery period where people are allowed a breather, a chance to get legal advice in order to make a determination. Unfortunately, many of these hoops um, are jumped through or, or sort of you know, rushed through because the main focus is the criminal justice approach. And this has become the dominant way to combat trafficking. And I think you know, that, that is, that is a, a big problem. Because as we know, you know, it's not just about criminality. It's about several underlying factors that are much deeper and that run much, you know, stronger um, than the criminal elements. And what we have in the Palermo Protocol is a limited criminal tool, which when you look at the wording of it itself is quite vague and uncertain. So abuse of vulnerabilities, what does that mean? What does coercion mean? You know, we work with some governments in the region, and when you ask them to look at the guidance from the OHCHR or UNODC on what these terms mean, they say, but that's not authoritative. Why should we? And then they come up with their own idea of coercion. And usually their idea of coercion is somebody physically coercing somebody else. But we know that that's not the truth. Most of coercion that we're seeing nowadays is, is invisible. And it's debt, it's, you know, other, other sort of, you know, uh, forms of, of pressure that people are put under. So I think as, as a tool, um, 
it has had some positive impact, but you know, I think that it is not in keeping with the current dynamic and the realities of what we're seeing on the ground. So you mentioned uh, systemic issues and the need for systemic interventions. Maybe you can walk us through what you think are good examples of these systemic interventions. And do you think there is space to tether these interventions to the protocol or should they be you know, a diff from coming from a different perspective or coming from different legal instruments? It's a, it's a difficult question because, you know, it, it really, if you look at, for example, labor trafficking, and if you look at, you know, some of, of the, the, the underlying triggers and the systems <clears throat> that allow exploitation in global supply chains, um, there are a few things that immediately come to mind that, that you know, must be addressed. <clears throat> One is the recruitment systems that allow um, people to be hired as second or third tier workers. So I'm thinking, you know, things like the kafala system or domestic worker systems where they're not recognized in formal labor laws or where people are hired very much as temporary workers so that you don't have to give them the protection of um, labor laws, etc or where you know women for example are very targeted in a particular sector because it is known that these women will bring their children to work because there's no other alternative or solution for them um, many many of those are systemic issues many of those are issues that that must be addressed we've seen with the recruitment issue for example that some companies are taking a lot of initiative and steps in this area in order to refund recruitment fees paid by migrant workers. But then there are other bigger issues there as well. For example, um, there is no digitization. Migrant workers, many of them are not on, on banking systems at all. There's no financial footprint. So how do you really verify that these people have not been extorted and are being paid their wages? We are seeing wage theft happen on a daily basis where people are told you're going to get paid this much they sign up to a job for that but by the time the computation is done various deductions are made and you know some they're not paid for overtime etc cetera, etc cetera. the the wage you know is is significantly less um and people are put in a position where they're often already indebted and they need to incur further debt and that really compresses a person's ability to actually step away from an abusive job in order to go towards another one because they would have to find more money to go find another job. So I think those are systemic vulnerabilities that, that need to be addressed. People will always migrate towards better opportunities. You know, I, uh, I, I'm guessing all three of us are probably migrants of some, some description or the other. And, and, you know, people do because, you know, the opportunities are not always great where you are and it, it is everybody's right to migrate. And I think when you, when you think about systemic issues, it is very important to, to remember that migration has to be accessible and made safe for people um, of all brackets, because it's only when these processes are not safe and are not available that criminality you know, rears its head and there is an opportunity for criminality to, to manifest itself. And I think another systemic change that, that must happen is the recognition of the contribution that workers bring to an economy. I mean, if one looks at the remittances that are made by migrant workers to their home countries, it is a staggering amount of money. And to be honest, a significant percentage of the GDP of countries like Philippines, etc. But yet when it comes to ascribing an economic value to the migrant workers work in the country where they're working, that number isn't there, it's, it's invisible. And when you look at sectors like domestic work, you know, or, or even other invisible uh, sectors, informal sectors, the protections there are so few. And, you know, the recognition of the value that these individuals bring to the table is also not there. So I think in the whole capitalist conversation, in the whole, you know, in that whole frame, human rights is not a market force. And that has got to change. Because the thing that runs this, this whole empire and this whole business is people at the end of the day. And, and therefore, that's a conversation that needs to be recalibrated and refocused. 
And, and it upsets me no end when we talk to companies and they say, this is a CSR thing. It is not a CSR thing. This is a business thing. Every business function in a company has to understand the human dimension of these issues because it is a major risk if they don't. And that's something that we are still grappling with and struggling with because a lot of the corporations still don't quite get it. And um, coming back to your question about the, you know, do we need another legal framework? Um, you know what? We have a lot of corporate accountability laws on the books. We don't use them. We don't use them because it's not possible to use them. Uh, the, the rule of law does not allow us and the lack of resources, the asymmetry of power does not allow us to take a case to court. And by the time the migrant workers are stuck in a, in a long court case that may last for months, they still need to work. They still need to move on with life. We don't have resources to match the corporations. Therefore, you will see corporate accountability action is quite low. It leaves a gap. And we don't see states showing any leadership when it comes to you know, holding corporations to account, really. And the most significant activity we've seen recently is the issuing of, of the uh, WROs by the Customs and Border Protection in the US. But then, you know, with all of these, with all of these, there are sanctions. Unfortunately, sanctions like these come at a very high cost for the workers who work in those companies. So who's thinking about them? Who's putting their interests first? And why is remediation never something that is talked about and on the table? So these are some very big questions that you know, need to be answered. And the, the answer doesn't just lie in the human rights world, it also lies in the corporate governance and controls world as well. And you know, having more laws or clearer laws is fantastic, but then educating people about them, ensuring that there is a possibility to enforce them, and that there, there isn't just the carrot, but there is also a big stick at the end of it in order to really bring corrective action. And that whatever happens, the migrant workers who are involved in that situation are not stigmatized and are protected um, is really important. So with respect to corporations, do you, do you think there is a value in approaches that seek to you know, engage them on the basis of goodwill or to persuade them of the business case of labor rights and to persuade them that this is a win-win solution and something that they might want to do or is good for their reputation? Or do you reckon we're going to have to accept that there needs to be some level of um, pressure and uh, reputational cost to them and legal, legal damages to them for this to happen and that in some ways this is zero sum? because workers' rights will mean less profits, but it's just more just. Like, how do you reckon we view corporations in this landscape? So here's, here's the thing. We, can't, we clearly can't leave them to their own devices to do what is right, because their, their compass of what is right is very different to what it should be. They, they are profit-driven, you know, that's, that's what they're in the business for, and, and, you know, rightly or wrongly, so that's what it is. There is a lot of conversation at the moment about companies having um, a social purpose, so a much bigger purpose, which encompasses a social purpose. But, you know, let's put it this way. We're very far from, from that situation right now. Um, I think from a company's perspective, it has to be attractive to them from a bottom line perspective, from a financial perspective, uh, to, to work towards protection and nurturing of, of workers. That's just a reality that we have to accept. So everything that, that, you know, for example, in conversations that I have, we always frame it in the framework of uh, this will help you identify risk early. It will help you manage risk. What you learn from there, you can feed into your company policy. You then become very attractive to buyers, to retailers, et cetera, because they want to do business with a company that has thought through its risk matrix and that has a risk dashboard and that is proactive about managing its risk. If you think about all the countries that now have a modern slavery legislation, mandatory human rights, due diligence, et cetera, this is going to become a norm globally. And, and potentially, you know, I hope Southeast Asia and Asia will follow suit at some point. But even if the West, the buyers, 
um, the key buyers and the key markets turn to pieces of law that are like that, which they are, mandatory human rights due diligence and modern slavery uh, disclosure, et cetera, this will have a knock-on effect on the supply chain, which is based in our part of the world. And there will be no option but for people to start cleaning up their racks. So what we're doing right now is we're saying to businesses, you must position yourself so that when the liability starts to pass down, you are ready to deal with it. So uh, an easier language to convey and to use is always legal, financial, and reputational risk, always. And that this is not two people in CSR's job to manage the whole thing. This comes from top down, bottom up. So everybody needs to be on board with what this means. And if you look after your workers, your productivity will increase. Uh, you become attracted to investors, you become you know, uh, more likely to be able to have good banking relationships, et cetera. And all in all, it's a win-win situation. But you know, we know that just leaving people to do what they think is right or what should be done is, is not enough. There needs to be a multi-layered approach where there is the carrot, there is the stick, there is disclosure, there is transparency, but with a big net of accountability there. Because right now that net is not there. You know, where do we go from here? I've, I've, the whole COVID madness you know, made me rethink lots of things, including how I work myself, um, how we live, what is important, what isn't important. And I'm sure a lot of people have been through, through these soul searching moments over the last few months. And I think when I, when I look, at, look at the work that has been done, when I look at, you know, where we want to go, I think it's a good time to reset and to rethink how we approach things. We know that the way we have been doing things does not work. We know that you know, we, we need to stop and rest, restart. Not to redo, but to just restart, reset, reset. And, and the reason why I say that is because just taking a criminal justice approach to a problem that has very, very strong roots in socioeconomic issues and social justice issues will not solve anything. So we can continue squeezing the poor victims that we find for every drop of information so that they can be good witnesses. We can continue to shelter them until such time as their case goes to court and potentially they get a few pennies of compensation if they're lucky. Or we can take the view that everybody in the world is on the move. This is just a reality. Migration is, is much needed because you know, there is a huge demand for uh, workers and for people across the world. And you know, because of economic disparity, people will be on the move. Therefore, we must treat people who come to our countries to work as part of our social movement, not as separate people. So what I mean by that is victims are not a separate category of people. If a child is rescued because they've been trafficked, they should not be given a different protection order to a local child who has been rescued from a situation of abuse. There should be one standard of protection for the migrant child and for the local child. So it is very important to take a social justice approach to drive the criminal justice approach. So they exist in complementarity and that, you know, we don't create secondary protection regimes for victims of trafficking, but rather they're treated holistically within existing social protection regimes. So when you think about, about you know, remediating a solution, uh, remediating a situation where somebody is a victim of trafficking or forced labor, you know, think about what would it take not to put them right? What would it take for them not to be retrafficked? How do we get them into that situation? How do you remove the underlying vulnerabilities? Do we need to consider a residence permit, the ability to work, a, a little bit of help to get off the ground, vocational training, et cetera? Um, and, and to think about it more in a long-term way that rather than in a short-termist victim, band-aid, fix, repatriate, and then six months later, they're back again. You know, I, I think really taking a developmental approach. So really thinking about, you know, about this from a development 
economics perspective as well. And, and thinking about solutions that are durable and that make sense. Because if you think about the, the term restitution and what it means in terms of compensation, it just means to put you back in the position you would have been had you not been exploited. Now, if you're put back in the situation where you had not been exploited, you'd be on the verge of exploitation, right? Because the underlying factors are still there. So what are you fixing? So, you know, looking at, at human trafficking and, and exploitation as a crime of many crimes, it's about discrimination, it's about inequality. Um, and, and it's one that requires a multi-pronged response as opposed to a flat criminal justice response. And, you know, a system that is flexible and dynamic enough and grounded in the realities of today. Let's just not think about individual perpetrators. Let's think about systemic perpetrators. How are we going to get to them? How are we going to make sure that the states are holding um, corporations accountable? And how are we going to make sure that the laws and the systems that exist have the resilience to face COVID-19 or similar threats? Right? We saw how many migrant workers were thrown by the wayside, chewed up and spat out by the system because there wasn't a care in the world for their welfare. So how do, how do social protection systems need to change in order to, to bring these people under their umbrella? And this has to be done in the destination countries because that's where they are. And so I think it requires that the, the destination country also take a very different view towards these people coming into work. And that all goes back to what I said earlier about recognizing the value of these people, the value that they bring to the economy, and therefore extending social protection and welfare to these people. So, you know, just in a nutshell, I think it's a good time to, to rethink some of our approaches and to try and build layers of complementarity to uh, the effort, existing efforts of the criminal justice system.